Hi, I'm George Nori, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you. We've got a great program for you today. Mike Barra back with us, New York Times bestselling author, lecturer, screenwriter, and television personality. He began his writing career after spending more than 25 years as an engineering designer consultant for major aerospace companies where he was a card-carrying member of the military industrial complex. Mike is a self-described born-again conspiracy theorist. He's got documentaries out called the secret space program ufos and others his books ancient aliens and jfk Lightbringer, and dark mission mike welcome back how have you been hey george i've been great i've been very busy and uh you know it just doesn't seem like there's enough hours in the day to get all the things done i'm working on so it's been uh it's been a busy busy time god that was a that was a really uh cheery news segment we had <laughs> oh my god wow wow Fleshy, when flesh eating bacteria is like the highlight, then you're like, wow, that's, uh, that's not fun. Guy <laughs> eaten by not. insects in his cell for, for oh, yeah. crying out loud. Right. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I get them all. Anyways, tell us about this new documentary. Yeah, it's uh, it's a really great documentary. I just, uh, it just came out. Um, it's called Secret Space UFOs Apollo 1 to 11. Uh, and it's out on Amazon Prime and some other uh, platforms that, that like iTunes and Voodoo and Apple TV. So you can get it there, Secret Space UFOs Apollo 1 through 11. Anyway, it was produced by a guy named Darcy Weir, who is, uh, is a friend of mine, coming a friend of mine, and is a really excellent producer and likes to do these kinds of um, uh, documentaries. He's got some uh, other ones he's planning on coming out with. And it's really just about the astronauts. From the Apollo program and their various UFO sightings, and it, you know, it's got it's got me, it's got uh, James Fox, it's got uh, Richard Dolan, you know, sort of the ultimate UFO power trio there. The heavy hitters. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know who the guitarist is, but uh, you know, I know I'm not <laughs> the drummer. We'll make we'll make Fox the drummer, and uh, me and Dolan will be the guitar player and the bass player. Nor are you the singer, right? Yeah, well, I guess, yeah. Probably not, George. I'm not. I'm not the singer that you are. But uh, you know, I don't know. We hear this stuff about these med beds. Maybe I'll have a singing voice after that. Maybe I can ask him to give me, you know, Simon Le Bon singing voice or something. You never know. You never know. Well, yeah, you and I both knew uh, Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut, walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. Edgar, in all his discussions with me, never admitted that he saw a UFO. He did tell me that he was told by people in government, these are real, these are happening. But he never told me directly he saw something. Did he ever tell you anything? No, he never He never came through with that. And, and Ed, Ed Mitchell is in the documentary, and his story is covered in that. Um, he, it never, no. And, in fact, he was very harshly critical. I remember there was an old uh, show with, uh, with, with him and uh, – my co-author on Dark Mission, <laughs> and uh, Mr. Hoagland, Mr. Hoagland, Mr. Hoagland, who called me the other day by accident. So, yeah, he was uh, he was on a couple weeks ago on the program. Yeah, um, and and you know Ed was really harshly critical of of Richard's moon information, especially the stuff about the glass structures. But of course now you know there's all kinds of new confirmations of that coming out. So it's kind of like did he know something or did he? Uh, and and you know was he just towing the company line? But he's also doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who tows the company line. You know he he pushed the limits quite a bit, including that um, that psychic experiment that he did when he was on the moon that not that many people know about. That's right. He did a he did a psychic experiment on the way from Earth to the moon, where he tried to do some kind of psychic powers, seeing if it would transfer. Yeah. Throughout the uh, cosmos, and uh, yeah, I, I thought I would leave that hanging there. So. <laughs> but, and then he started the Noetic Institute. 
Right, exactly, which was a ve- which I quote a lot in, in my book, The Choice. I talk a lot about some of their work. What he actually did was when – I think he was actually uh, – he did some stuff on the way to the moon, and when he was on the surface of the moon, he told, I don't, I don't know, five or six friends – this is like a remote viewing experiment. He, he told five or six friends, all right, at a certain time, I'm going to think about something in my mind, and I want you guys to draw a picture of what you get. And I, I forget what it was, a flower or something, but every single person on Earth – that was, you know, supposed to be tuned in at that time. Drew exactly what he um, he was thinking about, and he, you know, he went back and um and and showed his original. I think it was like an original thing. He had drawn something and got it in his mind, and they all picked it up. So that's pretty amazing. And and for him to um, talk about that and be that open about it, he's a man of great contradictions. You know, I well, mean, the, the, in Roswell, New Mexico. That's right. Places. Exactly. The fact, though, that he didn't see anything. What does that tell you about the other Apollo missions? Well, for one thing, it tells me he might not be telling the truth. Um, I'm not sure know, he'd lie to us, Mike. Well, I agree with you. But the, you have to remember that the, the other Apollo missions, this is really interesting because there is a certain amount of um, – brainwashing or something that went on with the astronauts i think you know uh, richard and i talked about that in dark mission and this is also in the documentary it's in secret space ufos um apollos 1 through 11 it's in the documentary where we talk about the fact that um there appear to be problems with their memories and it's really interesting because as you go through you know the um the different um documents and stuff of what these guys said, the debriefings, they can tell you chapter and verse, at this time I did this, at this time I did this, at this time I made, you know, stellar observations through the through the telescope. And at this time I, you know, I put out the ALSEP experiment. But for instance, Buzz Aldrin had a really hard time. He was asked on a national TV interview in, uh, on NBC, I think around 1970, what did it feel like to be on the moon? And he had a panic attack and ran out into the ran out of the interview, live interview. I remember that. Yeah. And threw up, threw up, and you know, threw up. And then, you know, there's a really interesting story um, that at a JPL event that that Richard was doing, um, that this lady came up and she said, you know, I was part of those debriefings of all the astronauts for Apollo 11. And she, you know, talked about her credentials and showed him some stuff. And, and she said, um, she said, you know, we hypnotized all of the astronauts to help them remember Hmm. the details. And then he said, well, okay, well tell me more about that. And and she kind of stumbled and she said, well, come to think of it. I I can't really remember much about what was said. Yeah. They they probably hypnotized her too. (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, there was a lot of that stuff. And I think the, the strongest case for that, George, is is really Al Bean. You know, if you look at Alan Bean, Apollo 12, um, fourth man on the moon. And when he got back uh, to Earth, he became an artist, right? He started painting, and he painted himself a self-portrait of himself on the moon. And it was all gray and boring, right? And just, But it bothered him, and he didn't like it. And he said, so I just kept doing more and more iterations of my cell portrait on the moon. And it got all the way to the point where he started painting the background in these pinks and purples and greens and blues and lavenders. And, and I, again, if the glass structure model that Hoagland came up with way back in 1994, if that's real, that's exactly what you would expect to see because you've got light bouncing all the way through all these different panes of let's, let's call it glass or crystal or whatever. And you're going to get a prismatic effect. So you're going to get all these different colors. And then when you enhance the pictures of, of these guys actually on the lunar surface, you see exactly that. You see that, that the actual color of the moon is multicolored, multi-hued with all of this very, very um, odd prismatic color. So, I mean, I think that that shows that Al Bean um, had a hard time remembering what the moon really looked like. And he finally came out, you know, finally got it out in his paintings. How did you come across this kind of information, Mike, to the point well, of doing the documentary? Well, it, it, you 
know, again, you went through stuff like the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal, which is actually just a massive treasure trove of information. And Darcy, Darcy Weir, the producer, he did a lot of work uh, going through that, going through the old motion picture footage, the um, obviously the photographs from the Hasselblad cameras. Um, and then, you know, there was stuff that was a um, item that was uh, basically it's like a black box that was carried on the Apollo missions. And he got into some of the transcripts of that dialogue, stuff that was never heard in public at the time. And, you know, you just, there, all these records exist, but you have to go back and go through reams and reams and reams. And, you know, you got, got to kind of know what you're looking for. That, uh, that helps a lot. But yeah, you got to go back and just reconstruct all this stuff from these, uh, these old sources, which are available online, most of them these days. And, I'm sure there's some alterations there, George, but a lot of it's real, and I think there's so much weirdness involved with the Apollo missions that it's actually um, pretty easy for stuff to slip through the cracks. Well, didn't the Apollo 11 astronauts talk about something in the foreground that they saw on the moon? And we could never quite understand what it was then, but what do you think that was? Well, the rumor is, and this comes, I think, from David Adair and some other folks, that um, they saw massive flying saucers, you know, on the rim of a crater. I don't know what crater they're talking about because, it, to me, Apollo 11 wasn't – there weren't really too many big craters there. But supposedly there were three of them on the rim of this crater, like observing them the entire time after they landed. And that Armstrong commented on this and said, you know, they were huge and they were really scary and that they communicated this information back – through their private channels. Now, I will say this, they're private channels, and they did have them, so they could talk to their doctor or whatever if they were having, you know, space gas or something that you didn't want to project over the public airwaves. But they said there are UFOs here on the moon, and it's really scary, and what do you want us to do about it? And and that, the thing about that story is, George, is that you, you go back, and I talked to Ken Johnston, Jr., who I know you know, and a guy named Marvin Zarnick, who used to work at Douglas and was personal friends with Buzz Aldrin for years. And they both told me that that story, that Armstrong radioed back and said, there's UFOs out here with us on the crater. What do you want us to do? That story was ripping through NASA. Ken Johnston and Marv Zarnick, um, two people I knew that worked at NASA back in the uh, in the 60s, you know, and, and Marv was – close personal friends with Buzz Aldrin for more than 20 years, um, told me that within 30 minutes of the Apollo 11 landing on, on the moon at Tranquility Base, that that story about the three UFOs parked on the crater rim was rifling through NASA. Like everybody was walking through the hallway saying, hey, did you hear what Neil said? He said, you know, they saw there's UFOs up there and all this other stuff. There's aliens up there and all this, you know, just over and over again. And that tells me that the story is probably true, George, because, I mean, when rumors like that come around at the time, then that's that's word of mouth that's happening, you know, in in situ at at the moment. So, I think that there's a, a really good chance that that story is actually true. And um, but what we don't know is, you know, some people have tried to put a really negative spin on it that they they ordered us off the moon and told us never to come back again, and that's why we haven't been back. Well, you know, we went back five more times, so <laughs> I don't think that that really adds up. But uh, it does seem like, you know, and that's what we talk about in this documentary. What Darcy Weir and put in the documentary is. Is stories like that and, you know, uh, the Apollo 11 UFO sighting they had on the way to the moon, all kinds of interesting stuff that's kind of been kept secret for years. Mike, did you get an official statement from NASA for the documentary? Uh, no, we didn't really get anything from them officially, but what are they going to say officially? You know, they're... Yeah, they still haven't said anything officially. No, I mean, look, you know, I'm... One of the things I'm doing, George, is I'm writing for a TV show, a YouTube channel called The Y Files, W H Y, The Y Files. And they're really super awesome. It's uh, hosted by a guy named AJ Gentili, and he has this little animated goldfish called Hecklefish with a tinfoil hat that heckles him. And they do about 30 minute videos 
on all kinds of cool um, subjects like that you talk about on Coast to Coast. He's a huge Coast to Coast fan. In fact, you should probably have him on. They got like 2 million subscribers on this channel wow. the last year. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So the show has just taken off. And I, I, I'm doing some writing for them. And I did, I did one on Solar Warden, a secret space program. But what I'm working on right now is the face on Mars, right? Mm -hmm. what, what it's reminding me of is I'm going back and I'm piecing this story together and trying to tell it in 30 minutes to a, a young audience that's never heard of it. Um, it's just how many times NASA lied, how many times they didn't tell the truth, how many times they manipulated information to make it look like the face was not artificial. And I, I'm totally convinced at this point that it is. But it's like, you know, when I look at that history, and it, it really goes up right up to 2005 or 2006, which is kind of when we stopped arguing about the face because I think it was so obvious that it was artificial. But, you know, looking at that track record, I just – I don't think we're ever going to get much official out of NASA. I think if there's disclosure of any kind, it's probably going to come through the private space ventures. I think you're right. Now, how did you line up uh, the great researchers uh, and filmmaker James Fox and the great ufologist Richard Dolan? Well, um, you know, Darcy had contacts with them. Fox has uh, obviously been doing a lot of uh, documentaries himself. And this – the interesting thing was that – this pers perspective on this documentary on the secret space UFOs one was right up his alley because he had a, uh, an adventure with Buzz Aldrin, gosh, I think almost 10 years ago, where he was going to meet him and Buzz was going to spill the beans. And so he tells that story in the documentary and, um, you know, he's a very busy guy. He's in Washington right now trying to get some congressmen to talk on the record about about disclosure although I, I you know again I'm, I'm pessimistic about government disclosure but um you know he's trying to get them on the record to talk about this stuff to investigate this stuff in greater detail and um and you know richard is just he's just one of those guys that's just very serious and and very solid about what he does he doesn't make very many mistakes and he stays um very much in the realm of the probable and he documents stuff. And, you know, he, he kind of reminds me of Stanton Friedman in some ways, because Stan, you know, was the best documentarist. He yes, was the guy he was. Who went, well, you know, I've got this paper and that paper and all that stuff. And uh, I'm too lazy to do that. Once I know something and I know it's real, I don't, I don't really keep track of, of uh, what, where do I get that exactly? Because I know it's true. It's a true fact. I'm a little lazy in that sense. But, you know, to have, um, to have them on the, on the documentary sort of adds gravitas to the whole thing. And uh, they tell some fascinating stories. I mean, I mean, James Fox's story about Buzz is, is bizarre. I mean, he he uh, had an, a meeting arranged with Buzz Aldrin in Monaco, of all places, where he flew out there to meet with them. And he, he gets to the hotel, and there's a message from Buzz. Uh, you know, they were agreeing to do an interview. He says, I'm not going to do an interview. So then he called up to his room and said, dude, you know, Come on, I flew all the way to Monaco, yeah. and I want to do this interview, and this is really important for the human race. And, and Buzz just basically said, you know, look, they've threatened my family and threatened people that are close to me, and I don't know what good it will do to tell my story at this point. And that was, that was 10 years ago. So I, I would give anything to get, to get Buzz on the record because not only did he have these UFO sightings, the, the one that he's publicly talked about on the way to the moon – he also, I, I want to ask him about the the Masonic the ceremony that they performed in the lunar module before he and Neil went out on the first spacewalk. There's so much to ask him, and there's just, you know not very many of these guys left, George. They're, just they're, don't ask him to swear on a Bible. Ah <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if I do, I'll put up my left hand to uh, stop that right cross from coming in. That was a pretty good shot, actually. Well, I could understand how he got offended when somebody said you didn't go to the moon. I mean, the yeah. guy the guy risked his life for America, mm -hmm. and uh, for somebody to embarrass him like that was crazy. It, it is, and especially since, who was it, Bart Sabrell? I mean, yeah. most of this stuff is just nonsense. It's just so dumb. And, um, yeah, I, I don't see that as, um, you know, meaning that, that Buzz... Uh, you know, felt guilty or was trying to hide. I just think he got PO'd at the guy and and gave him what he deserved because, I mean, he did risk his life and so did the other guys. And, um, you know. And, and, yeah. and some did. 
and some did. Yeah, some did lose their lives. The Apollo 1 astronauts absolutely lost their lives trying to get us to the moon. And it's, it's, it's a disrespect for those guys um, that I think is just really not – it's not right. And um, they, they deserve better than that. I, I don't think that they're lying about you know what they saw or didn't see there. I think, um, I think there's some guys that have signed – these agreements where they can't talk about things that they've seen, but that's, that's not something I'm going to criticize them for. I mean, you know, if, if I had people threatening the ones that I loved and you can't say this or they're going to, they're going to be killed. It, that's pretty heavy burden to carry. And, and, and I think as we discussed earlier, I think actually most of the reason why you don't get a lot more disclosure out of the astronauts is, uh, is because of the, uh, the, the brainwashing effect more than anything else. How do people see this new DVD documentary? Well, you can catch it on uh, Amazon Prime. Again, it's Secret Space UFOs, Apollo 1 through 11. Uh, go to Amazon Prime. It's on iTunes. It's on Vudu and Apple TV, and it's going to be on lots of other streaming sources. So you can pick it up on all of those those different services. And uh, it really would be good if you did it because, um, you know, Darcy and the guys, uh, he wants to make more documentaries. And I think it's important that we get these things made and, and get information out to people. Because, George, let's face it, you got you to gotta retell the same old stories every five years because you got a new generation coming along that That's true. doesn't know any of this stuff. Yeah, that is absolutely true. What are you working on now besides the documentary that just came out? Well, I'm working, like I said, I'm doing some writing for the Y Files. I've got uh, two assignments there. And you, so some of my work is going to be showing up on their channel in the next couple of weeks. I'm working on the Ark of the Covenant and the Face on Mars. And I really, really want to do Stanley Kubrick but, uh, and the, the moon landings. But uh, we'll see if they let me do that or not. So I'm doing that. And then I have appearances coming up. I'm going to be going to, um, I just got done with Roswell in, in March, and I'm going to be going to Spruce Pine. Spruce Pine UFO Festival, um, uh, UFO Expo, actually, with Tom Reed on June the 10th in North Carolina. That's going to be really fun. And then I'm going to be doing a um, show in Las Vegas and uh, in September, and then another one in uh, Barcelona, Spain. I get to go to wow. Spain this year. So, I'm, uh, you know, I got a lot of things on my plate. The writing is going on. I'm not working on any books because I, I just feel like I, I got to wait and see how this whole um, – <laughs> this whole thing that the whole world is going through right now ends before I, I have any more thoughts to add to it. You know, you think with the release of the Tic Tac videos, there's more interest in UFOs these days by general people? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I have my personal opinions about what is on those videos, and I, you know, I'm, not really, I'm not really that enthusiastic about them as alien spacecraft. But what I will say is that, yeah, it's absolutely increased the interest. And how can it not? Because the government... And the media have gone out of their way to make a big deal out of it, which is, you know, a, a big change from what we experienced, gosh, you know, for the last 20, 30, 40 years. It's completely different. So it used to be that we were – it was a real fringe subject, and now it's not so much anymore. Really, since the X-Files came along, it's gotten really mainstream. And But now you see people talking about this stuff all the time. I mean there's a whole – what was that term they come up? They came up with that I refuse to use. UAP. U UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. Right, and actually, I found out Nick Pope was the guy who came up with that, which makes me want to use it even less. I was teasing Nick. I'm like, well, now that I know you came up with it, I'm not going to use it at all. But you know, it's the government trying to change the language, and um, and, and so that's become a you know, there's a UAP Twitter out there, and that's all they talk about is these videos. Absolutely. Now, what what do you think the Tic Tac uh, videos may depict? Well, it, it you know I think a lot of these are drone aircraft, probably um, probably Chinese or Russian that we're picking up. They also I think in a couple cases of those you know those TTSA videos, the videos from the To the Stars Academy folks that they got from the Pentagon, uh, those all took place, George, in uh, naval weapons testing grounds. Well, okay. That's true. So, that's true. I think some of them are ours. I mean, I, the the gimbal UFO thing to me looks like uh, looks like a drone, like an X forty seven B, which is a project I worked on around that time in in two thousand three. It's a winged aircraft that you're looking at from the top, and the, the Tic Tac stuff. It's really interesting because when you go into the videos, it's like 
the reports that we get about these objects don't match the video that we're seeing. It's like the video is only a small part of it. So um, I don't know. I feel like there's a narrative here and an agenda that's being pushed forward. And I, you know, you know me, I'm always skeptical about anything the government puts forward like that. Well, that's true. But uh, if their drones are pretty darn fast. Well, yeah, but some of them, you know, I mean, that, like that Tic Tac, I, I did a video about this. And this is what I talk about. My, my current presentation this year is what I'm talking about. The, like the Tic Tac, they say, well, it zooms off to the left um, of the screen. And actually what happens is there's a, there's a zoom factor on the camera. And the camera just zooms up and they lose the lock. And I don't think it really moves at all. Um, but the other thing, too, is, look, let's face reality. We we've talked about this before on this show on like books I did like Hidden Agenda back in 2016. We've had UFO anti gravity technology I think probably since 1958 when we really figured out how to do it. And you know I think it goes all the way back to arts parts and those uh, those parts that Linda Moulton Howe has. I mm-hmm. think that's all T Towns and Brown technology that's been developed over the last 20, 30, 40 years. So these could be ours. I think I think they could be our uh, craft that we're just you know we're just messing with um, messing with our own military to see how they react to this stuff. Mike, uh, tell us another story of uh, one of the Apollo astronaut uh, missions that uh, ca- caught your eye. Well, I, I think the one here that's most compelling is is really the buzz the story that Buzz tells, which actually wasn't just happened didn't just happen to him. It happened to him and Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins, which is that after they got in uh, to translunar injection and they were on their way to the moon, um, the first day near the end of the day, they they were looking out the window and they saw this glowing um, object following them, and it was it was you know kind of paralleling them at the same speed. And they thought, well, this is really weird. It shouldn't be the um, the uh, S-4B, which is the third stage of the Apollo rocket. Right. It shouldn't be there. So they called up NASA on the private channel, which is another way you know that they had private channels. And they said – oh, no, sorry, on the public channel. They said, do you guys know where the S-4B is? Because they couldn't say, well, we've got a UFO. <laughs> Following us, about, yeah. Right? And um, – and they said, well, it should be 5,000 miles behind you, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And they're like, that thing ain't 5,000 miles away. It's a lot closer than that. So um, they kept watching it and watching it, and it seemed to just be paralleling them. And finally they kind of said, well, we're just going to have to go to sleep because it was their sleep cycle. And they did. They went to sleep, and when they got up the next day, it was gone. But there was something in there, in space, that was trailing them. Uh, and not falling behind, which means it can't be the third stage. It was not falling behind, um, you know, for uh, hours and hours. And I think that's a really compelling story that uh, comes straight from Buzz. I mean, he, that's one he did talk about. And why did you stop at 11, Michael? You could have kept going. Well, I, you know, I think it was – this is about the early Apollo missions in Georgia, and I think that they uh, – Darcy's going to probably do another documentary, a follow-up, where we're going to look at the other missions. But Because it's, it's, a, it's a huge, exhausting process to go through all of this uh, information. You know, you got you got to look at the black box transcripts and, um, you know, the weird stuff about hearing music on, on the dark side of the moon kind of thing. There's a lot to go through. So I think it's just a question of you got to break it up into – Two or three different chapters to get all the uh, all the great stories out. Do you think the Apollo astronauts were compelled to sign non disclosure agreements? Well, that's been implied. You know, you remember when uh, John Glenn was on the Frasier TV series back in two thousand three? That was a super popular sitcom at the time, and that's basically what he you know he said. He did this thing where he he goes off on a tangent in, in the radio uh, studio and he starts just talking into the microphone while there's a, a, you know, fight going on in the background. And he starts telling people that they were all like forced to lie, that they were forced to sign disclosure, non-disclosure agreements. And so, yeah, I, I actually think that that's uh, very viable. Um, and, and, I, and that's what Buzz said to James Fox. Now, I don't think that James is a liar. I think he's telling the absolute truth about his conversation with Buzz that, you know, we signed this agreement and he told me if I break it, they're going to go after my family. So I, I, yeah, I think it's absolutely true. Well, and when you do sign a non-disclosure agreement, you are subject to the penalties if you break the agreement. You are. And, you know, um, that's why you always want an NDA that has an expiration date, right? 
<laughs> I guess. But yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, those things are binding till the end. Well, I mean, look, let's look at an example. There's a certain uh, former um, performer who owes a certain former president $621,000 because she broke a non-disclosure agreement. So yeah, they're, they're binding and they're, uh, they're absolutely, um, absolutely enforceable. It is truly remarkable. What, uh, what do you think now that the Soviet union has collapsed and Russia's doing what it's doing, what are they doing with space other than taking astronauts up to the ISS? Not, not much, and it's really interesting because you know Russia is obviously engaged in the uh, the conflict in in uh, Ukraine. Well, what used to be Russia, but now it's Ukraine, right? Um, and um, that that's taken up a lot of their resources, so their space program has really taken a back seat, as you just observed. So I don't know what the plan is there. I know that um, from what I understand about the political situation is that this is going to take focus. This is going to be their focus for the next few years. So I, I don't see any advancement really in their space program for quite a while unless they get it in their heads, you know, unless uh, Vlad gets it in his head that he wants to embarrass the United States even more than he already has by exposing stuff. Because that's certainly, you know, they're certainly in a position to send spacecraft as the Chinese have done. And I don't know if you talked about this when you had Richard on the other day, um, but a couple months ago, but um, you know, when they landed on the backside of the moon, they took more images that showed this glass structure stuff um, on on the far side of the moon. Russia could do the same thing. They could they could fly probes to Mars. They could fly probes to the moon, and they could take really good, honest pictures of a lot of this stuff and send them back and just really put the United States on their back heels. So that might be part of the agenda. It just, it just depends. It's a very volatile, obviously, political situation in Europe right now. Plus, it's getting older, and we all slip a little bit as we get older. But, um, you know, he's sharp as a tack when he's recounting these stories. And um, obviously, it made a huge impression on him, and we have no reason to question his integrity about this. So I, I'm glad, sir, that you finally got some confirmation. Watch the documentary. It's all in there. What got you so excited about space, Mike? I know you were in the engineering area for years, but why about space and this angle you've gone? I mean, I'm well, glad you have, but what got you interested? Well, I was, all, I don't know, coast to coast AM? <laughs> um, huh. I don't know. You know, George, that, that question I get a lot. And, the, you know, I, I, met, um, I met Bill Mooney, Will Robinson. Great guy, by the way. Space. Wonderful guy. guy. At um, at one of the alien cons in like 2018, and we were talking about that, and I said, you know, Bill, I didn't I didn't get into this whole space and aliens thing because I watched Lost in Space or because I watched Star Trek. <laughs> I was already into it. I mean, I literally, George, I was born this way. I was born to to be. I was born to explore space and aliens and space travel, and that's why I watched those shows when I was a kid. And that's why I watched all the, all the rocket launches. I mean, some of my earliest memories, my earliest memories of black and white uh, TV memory of uh, one of the Gemini missions where the, the rocket, the engine started and then they cut it off right away. And that's embedded in my, in my mind. So why, why is a five, four, five, six, six year old watching this stuff on TV? I don't know, but I was born this way. And that's all I can tell you. That's fantastic. It, it got me started. That, you know, it's, that's what got me into broadcasting. When I was 11 years old, I decided I wanted to unravel UFO stories because my mother brought me home a book called We Are Not Alone by Walter Sullivan. Look mm -hmm. Magazine did the uh, interrupted journey with Barney and Betty Hill. And I said, oh. I said, the only way I can get answers is to be a news person or a journalist because I can't do it if it was just George Norrie, some kid calling people. So I'm going into broadcasting, Mom, when I grow up. And she said, all right, Georgie, go for it. And here I am. Yeah, exactly. That, that Your life was defined at that moment. And, you know, if you want to go into really a deeper spiritual aspect of this, I mean, look, we all, we all come into these lives with a plan, right? And even the people that we meet along the way, I think, is, is to a certain extent planned. And, you know, that was your path to get to this truth, and, and mine was whatever it ended up being. You know, I didn't really get serious about the UFO research aspect of it or the alien research until I was, you know, um, older. 
and I'd already kind of finished my career. I mean, I was always interested in it, but in terms of actually being a part of it, it started it started really late for me. And for you, it started, you know, from the time you were a kid. And yeah. Who who knows? You just gotta follow the easiest path the easiest path the easiest path in life to follow is the one you should be on. Let's go to Brendan in Austin, Texas. Welcome to the show. Hey Brendan. Hey, thank you so much, George and Mike. And uh I gotta thank everybody for listening and uh, the people of China, Iran, Israel, and the whole world, we all just want peace. The whole world just wants peace and freedom. So thank you for saying that also at the beginning. You're welcome. And uh, so I had a question for you, Mike, if we have time at the end and, uh, about your opinion on something. But I just wanted to muse on the Apollo crew's memory real quick. So the Apollo crew was having these issues with their memory, and Art Bell had had a couple interviews where he asked about that. and the he also had mentioned how the astronauts had had issues with drinking, divorce, and violence, just kind of in, indicative of suppressing things or lies or trauma. And I think it was Buzz, possibly, who said that he can't remember the emotions of the flight and the mission because he had such intense training to keep him calm in space so that they didn't have a panic attack in space and die. It sounds like that almost happened even despite his training. But uh, then he has an interview, or Edgar has an interview where he has this trauma response of having a panic attack and running out at a simple question. And Buzz gets a simple question and has a trauma response and ends up hitting another human being. And they're saying that they have intense training to keep themselves calm in space, but they can't stay calm during an interview. And uh, with Edgar Mitchell, on the flip side, that was the interview where he was emotionally, like, numbed out. But on the flip side, there was another interview with Walter Link he did where he talked about he was really emotional on the way back, and he had this epiphany. And the exact quote, he said, perhaps the story of ourselves as told by science was incomplete or flawed. And he went back to Earth and immediately delved into India and Sanskrit and 5,000-year-old description of his experience emotionally called Samadhi. And I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that, but uh, it basically, when he went, came back and went into like Graham Hancock type stuff and advanced a aliens and stuff. But my question is, if you want to talk about it, uh, as Mike, as a 25-year engineering consultant, do you have any opinion on the story of Phil Schneider who was also an engineering consultant that talked about the underground Dulce base and a war with aliens and stuff like that? Um, do I have an opinion about it? No, those stories have been around for years, and they make a lot of sense. There was a device called a nuclear subterrane, which was basically um, a fairly miniaturized nuclear reactor that heated up this device that basically carved through rock Kind of like, remember that uh, Star Trek episode, George, with the hoarder that looked like a sausage pizza? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can eat its way through rock, right? Way back. And it's kind of, kind of the same thing. And it, you know, it, leaves, it leaves a glass uh, seal on it and these huge tunnels, and they built these things. I mean, there's pictures of them in the 1970s. And so I think all those stories are very probably true. The problem with so many stories in, in uh, the UFO lore is that there's not anything except the stories. You know, I I lean towards um, – I, I had a chance to spend some time with Whitley Strieber and Richard, Richard Doty in um, Manchester last October. And, you know, the thing is those guys, they have a lot of stories, but they also have evidence that these things happen. You know, they, there's like supporting evidence. The stuff like the Dulce base, the story's been out there forever. It may have happened. My opinion is that it probably did happen or something like it happened. But it's it, you know they become they become the thing of myth, George. They become these stories that we repeat over and over again, um, and but we don't know if they're really true or not. But they are pretty scary. I mean, that's a scary story that this alien got out and started vaporizing people. That's uh, a dulcy thing. Is um, but it's probably true because uh, the technology was there to have built all these deep underground military bases. Absolutely. As uh, you know, we claim land when we get there first. Why didn't we do that with the moon? Well, personally, I think we did. I think that's what Buzz Aldrin's ceremony was. 
Um, you know, he took a he took a Masonic apron with him to the moon to perform a ceremony with. He talked about in his biographies, both of them, that he and Neil Armstrong confirmed this in his biography that they did a little thing with wine and chalices and uh, broke bread and stuff. And and this all sounds Christian, but it actually has its root in ancient Egypt. And, you know, the Freemasons, they're all focused on ancient Egyptian religions. So they did perform. I think they did consecrate the moon as a temple. I think that's what the mission of Apollo 11 really was. And, you know, George... I think that's why there's no pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon. All the pictures of Neil of the of Apollo 11, they're all Buzz Aldrin. They were all taken by Neil. There's no pictures of Neil Armstrong on the moon, just Buzz Aldrin. And I actually argue that's why Buzz went out second, was uh, so that Neil could photograph him. Interesting. First, first Freemason to walk on the surface of the moon. Why did Neil stay so silent when he came back? Well, you know, that's interesting. He's a shy person anyway. He wasn't he wasn't really a very talkative guy, and he wasn't big for the press and all that kind of thing. I don't think he liked the press very much. And, you know, everybody always – they always show you the footage of the press conference, the official Apollo 11 press conference, and how serious and dour Neil and Buzz and Michael Collins were. And the truth is, is that not much scared Neil Armstrong, if you get into it, except talking to the press because he was always concerned that they would distort – what he said into something different, which, you know, a lot of the press really does do that kind of thing. So when I look at that, what I see is these three guys who've done this incredible thing, but who are very nervous, really, about being in front of the press. And again, let's face it, uh, George, we already know they saw a UFO on the way to the moon. Um, I think they were all under pressure not to reveal the truth. So when, when I look at that, I don't, think, oh, well, they faked it, and we never went to the moon. I think they went to the moon, and they saw some things they're not allowed to talk about, and and they're repressing that. And I think that accounts for their attitude. And the easiest way to keep an NDA if you're Neil Armstrong, you know, is to just never talk to anybody. And that's practically what he did. He had very few interviews, very few things that he did uh, in terms of press after the initial Apollo 11 tour. And even then, he hardly commented. I mean, he was he was the quiet one. So Collins and, and Buzz uh, were a lot more uh, evocative when it came to, you know, telling stories and talking about stuff. We get texts and tweets for you, Michael. Tom, what do you have for Mike? Hey, Mike, Randy in Salt Lake City would like you to talk about heat shields, reentry, and the dangers that they have when they do come back. Well, okay, when you're coming back from... Um, From space, I mean, your speed can be, gosh, anywhere up to about, I think, 17,000 miles an hour when you're returning from translunar space. Because you have to remember that the spacecraft, they would fire their rockets, and then they accelerate um, to, like, the midpoint where gravity takes over. Well, they accelerate for a little while. But then after the burn, they coast. And coast to coast, George. And then (laughs) as they come back in towards Earth, their speed increases because the gravitational pull is pulling the spacecraft towards the earth so they speed up and speed up and speed up and so they you know that was the toughest thing i think they had to do the biggest challenge is how do you um make this craft survive this these incredible temperatures of thousands of degrees uh centigrade and fahrenheit and and they came up with this ablative surface that you know like one layer peels off heat resistant layer peels off and then there's another and then there's another and the idea is is that you know you don't peel off uh, all of them, so everybody survives. And, you know, of course, there were Russian missions where the heat shield failed, and they lost the crew. And yeah, there's, that was horrible. There's horrible radio recordings of those things. So um, it's not an exact science, and I, I, think we're, um, I think we're pretty fortunate. Mike, what's your best uh, website for people to get to? Uh, MikeBerra.blogspot.com. I still got an old blog spot. I I looked at doing some other sites, but this is the simplest, easiest way to do uh, to find me. And, you know, you can just use Google and type in my name, and it should be the first or second one that comes up after after some page attacking me. <laughs> Mike, Apollo 8, 1968, as it was circling the moon, Jim Lovell, one of the astronauts, said, be in, please be informed there is a Santa Claus, of which many people thought he was making reference to a UFO. Remember that? I absolutely remember that, and um, I'm not sure he wasn't. I mean, I think it does sound like code, 
And other people have argued that it was a code trend, coded transmission. And, you know, yeah, I, I think it probably was, George, because what a, what a great way to get away with it. You know, what a great way to get away with it is that around Christmas time, because on Christmas Eve, they read from, um, you know, the book of Genesis. That's right. It was, a, it was an amazing moment. So, yeah, I remember that. I remember hearing that. And they didn't really say, oh, you know, oh, he's talking about, you know, you can see Santa Claus in space. It, that's just, it's like they said that in the middle of the conversation for no reason, with no context. Yeah, please be informed. There is a Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. I love that. Kubrick, most people don't know this, but Kubrick could quote from the Brookings Report chapter and verse. I mean, there's a Playboy interview, and I only I only read Playboy magazine for the articles, George, just so everybody knows. Okay, I agree. Um, and um, he, he quoted long passages of, of the Brookings Report, which is a report that basically told NASA, you know, you're probably not going to run into E.T. out there, although it sounds like they did. Um, but you might find artifacts, you might find ruins, you might find, um, you know, instruments, you might find uh, tools. And if you do, you should seriously consider not telling anybody about it because it will drive them crazy. And that's the basis for the Hal story. I mean, Hal went crazy because he he was told that they, you know, had discovered artifacts from a previously advanced civilization and he couldn't tell anybody about it so it made him nuts so there's all kinds of cool messages in in both of those films along those lines and i I think arthur c clark definitely knew and understood this stuff i i believe clark is somebody who would have read that brookings report uh to nasa cover to cover absolutely and so did kubrick quite obviously remember kubrick's movie eyes wide shut oh yeah Yeah. it's another strange one wasn't it well i think he was telling you then you know, how does Hollywood really work? What's the first thing he did when he got the leverage to make his own films and control his own films? He moved the hell out of Hollywood and went straight to London. So, interesting. The YouTube channel, The Y Files, I mean, they got 2 million subscribers talking about all this stuff. And there's little 30-minute episodes that they do. And, and that's a sign that everything is taking off, the popularity of the X-Files. So, people are awake. And they're waking up steadily, slowly, but surely, which, by the way, speaking of the Brookings Report, you know, George, that's exactly what it suggested, is that you use popular culture to get everybody comfortable with the idea of there being aliens and that they might be superior to us technologically in some way. So, I mean, I think we're living it. And I, I don't agree. Um, I don't agree that we're, that we're primitive or that we're, we're not advanced. I think we're I think we have a very special condition here, you know, a very special spiritual orientation on this planet. And we're, it it takes a lot of courage to be born into this life because you don't get to remember heaven. You don't get to remember where you came from. You have to live here all by yourself. You have to come here all by yourself. And so I kind of disagree with that from a spiritual perspective. But what I would say is I see the country and the world waking up uh, all the time, year by year. Although I got to be honest, George, I think we've kind of reached. <laughs> I think we've reached the roach limit. I think we've reached the limit here. I don't. I, I see the people that don't want to know really becoming entrenched in their positions, and I, I think now we have to decide how are we going to go forward with them or without them. Because I don't know that we're going to reach that many more people at this point. I really don't. Michael, would you consider yourself very spiritual? Um, yeah, in a, um, in a non-religious way, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, for instance, I absolutely believe Jesus, um, existed and that he was the son of God and all that stuff, but I don't, I, I'm not a practicing Christian. I don't go to church. So, um, yeah, I do. And I, you know, I wrote a book back in 2010 called The Choice, which is all about how you connect the science, the physics to this, these spiritual belief systems that the hippies have. And they actually do connect, and there actually is science behind all of it. And that's something I'd like to help educate people more on. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it, yeah, I am. But sometimes you get messages and you don't know, <laughs> you don't know what the heck you're supposed to do with it, right? <laughs> so that's happened to me a few times here lately. Like, okay, great. I got, I got that there's a message here. Just what are you trying to tell me? I wish, I wish things were clearer, George. I really do. And I remember in Albuquerque when Richard first showed me that, <laughs> and it just 
blew me out of my seat because as you build up to the, this is in Shorty Crater. It's Apollo 17. The uh, caller's correct. It's in a crater called Shorty Crater. There's several pictures of it. And there's all this mechanical stuff around it. And then you see this thing, which looks actually looks like C-3PO. It looks more like C-3PO. But he called it Data's Head because there was... I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. And, I mean, this thing is incredible. And it's exa- it looks like a mechanical head of a robot. It's the right size. It's everything perfect for it to be a humanoid robot. I don't think it was living biological tissue because in the very harsh radiation environment of the moon it would have deteriorated by now even if it had only been there a few years and it probably had been there for you know hundreds if not thousands if not millions of years so i do think it's mechanical uh and richard did multiple enhancements of it and it's uh, it's a phenomenal find and you know i'm not sure that's not one of the things they brought back in the in the diplomatic bed you know from the moon and did some reverse engineering on it. i'm sure they did or at least stuff like that so that's a fascinating artifact. Michael, once again, how can people watch Secret Space UFOs? You can go to all of the usual uh, suspects. You can go to um, Amazon Prime. You can go to iTunes. You can go to Vudu. Um, you can go to all these different uh, in places and pick up this information. Where's the other one? Uh, Apple TV. Sorry, Apple TV. Oh, great. And also MikeBarrett.blogspot.com. It's on there. And George, I'm back on Twitter. They've let me back on Twitter Good. Mike Barra, 333. Find me on Twitter. I, I would appreciate it. See you around one of these events up here in the future, Michael. Thank you for being sure. on the program. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.